Welcome, you are listening to The Travel Winds, hosted by Pete Kotzbach. This is a weekly interview show about people who travel for work and all the ups and downs that go along with it. Each episode includes a variety of discussions with athletes, business people, musicians, influencers, entertainers, and even regular folks from around the world. Thanks for listening. Here we go. Hey, my guest today is Tanya Callahan. How are you today, Tanya? Very well, thank you. I appreciate the time. We're uh, just talking briefly about how being on the road so much is an awkward thing at times. I don't think if for people that are watching the video, they won't have to wonder what you're doing with everything that's set up behind you. But I guess I'm a bass player from <laughs> Ireland. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Ireland part is kind of given away too, by the way. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I was like, I have to put a flag up. But yeah, it's 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 definitely yeah, as we were saying, it's like uh, you're you're a natural traveler. Or you're not, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes you're forced into being a natural traveler. Yeah, well, the nature of my job, <laughs> touring, and then when well, you get so used to it, you don't know any other lifestyle. Eventually, I think I've I've literally been on the road for probably just ten years, bar a month here and there. <laughs> yeah, I I always tell people because people ask me about my show, and I go musicians by far, travel I mean, more than athletes or business people. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we do because it's like tours. What people don't realize about tours is like they usually go for a couple of consecutive months. Yeah. You're just like literally moving the entire time for months. So it's uh, it's just because, yeah, it's, I mean, it's the lifestyle that I know and I love it. But like we were just saying, it's like the reentry period to coming home for a moment is really weird. <laughs> well, for you, I mean, because you were just over in Europe with with White Snake. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, how bad is the time lag, the jet lag for you? Well, you know, it's funny. I've never really suffered jet lag. And um, that's how much I travel. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I learned a long time ago on my first tour to China, which I really got bad jet lag because you're going so far east because you always yeah. lose time. That's when you get when you gain time, it's easier to adapt. So when you're coming west, but east is always harder. But what I, I did the wrong. I remember my first I landed in. We got into Beijing and we had left Ireland at, you know, in the morning. And then we landed in the morning. So it was like, oh, shit, I've been awake for 20 something hours and went to sleep. And then you wake up at night and it's like game over. You're yeah. screwed. So I learned from that tour. Don't ever go to sleep until it's the time, the night time or as close yeah. to night time in the new time zone. Just push through. If you absolutely have to nap, set 10 alarms, because if you don't readjust immediately, your circadian rhythm is going to be like, whoa. What's going on here? Yeah, yeah. Jet lag is actually not something I really suffer, which is, uh, it's just something that I mastered because I travel. So <laughs> well, and then, like, you know, staying hydrated and all the good stuff. Yeah, but I was just saying hy hydration. And a lot of the athletes I talk to always have to, when they do the same thing, they go to Japan or China, they, mm -hmm. they, they, they have to take a couple extra days just so their bodies, because, you know, you're used to competing at a certain time. So oh, is yeah. it the same way with, with performing? Absolutely. And it depends where you're going. Um, it's funny because sometimes just U.S. tours, like if you're just going to the East Coast and yeah. you're flying and playing the same day, you can get really tired because it's only three hours. But then you're kind of like just slightly out of sync. Whereas I've done, you know, at one stage I was in two bands at one stage that were touring. And I remember getting off stage in um, Chicago with Jordan Fisher, getting on a flight and flying to London to play with Dee Snyder or which band was which way, I can't remember, yeah, the same yeah. day. And I was so overtired that I was able to just do like 30 just keep going. hours. <laughs> and I needed like a day or two. But so it just depends. Like, it depends on the person as well. Like, I am I can go a long time and then I do need my sleep. But unfortunately, you get used to sleeping on very little. But yeah, and then it depends. Like, I remember traveling to South America a couple of times, like places like Bolivia where the altitude is very high and you absolutely have yeah. to have at least a day, maybe two to acclimate because you have to literally adjust to like 30 Your lungs the altitude. Yeah. So it, it just, you know, it really depends where you're going east, west, you know, altitude, all these factors come in. And I think that's why it's so important to just look after your health when you're traveling, because you're putting your body into a metal capsule flying across the world, <laughs> literally dehydrating, like screwed up your circadian rhythm, all that. And then you have to be on. So it's, uh, it's definitely like a factor that is, is something that keeps me sane and able to tour. <laughs> well, so one of the, the very cool things I was super excited to talk to you about was your eating habits. Yeah. Well, the traveling, being a vegan, it's got to be a little bit easier now, I would think. 
Yeah, Whereas I mean, 10, 15, 20 years ago, not so much. Yeah, it, uh, for me, it's funny because I've been a vegan. There was no word when I was yeah. little, my whole life, pretty much. Um, and so for me, it's just it's just how I eat and it's habits. I feel like when we start to categorize these things as diets, yeah. it makes them sound more complicated than they actually are. Um, I find it easy everywhere. I've never found it hard because it's just how I eat and I will not put like processed crap into my body. I don't obviously don't eat animals and, and dairy and stuff, but as far it's more like finding a healthier option that yeah. can be difficult. And that ironically, it's harder in the US half the time because there's yeah. so much processed food, like especially when you're in the Midwest and middle America, there's so such a, you know, obesogenic kind of um, market out there that it's it's not good even even when you go to you know you're going to the gas station you're on a tour bus everybody floods into mcdonald's and wendy's i always go in and i'll get like you know some fruit nuts popcorn whatever until we get somewhere for a decent meal but the thing is and i always say this it's funny i've had some of the best meals of my life plant-based in steakhouses because there are places that have the freshest produce like a really good steakhouse whatever that means to non-vegans yeah and have amazing fresh produce and chefs if you're polite about it and you're not being like this you know dietary pain in the ass if you're like hey you know like i eat plant-based would you mind and they're all excited to do something new yeah. so i have all these great food memories across the world in like these places where my band members or colleagues or whatever are saying oh sorry tanya we're going to a steakhouse tonight are you going to be okay i'm like i will be you. because it's how you know it's just it's just how I eat so it's very easy for me to read a menu that's in a non-vegan place and be like okay they have all the carbs they have all the veggies so you just ask lightly you know can so it's it's just it's kind it's psychology like everything with food is psychology it begins with psychology so if you want to eat healthy you will if you don't you won't and for me I care way too deeply about animals and the impact of animal agriculture so I refuse to spend my very hard-earned money on supporting a system that I don't believe in and it's just so it's it's morals at that stage it's like oh I'll have a cheat day and I'll you know have (laughs) I know way too much about the food system unfortunately so when I see food I, I know exactly what it took to get there that's it's interesting. I, I watched um, a documentary, uh, Forks Over Knives. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And that kind of makes you yeah. relook I things. That. I love that documentary because it comes at such a nice angle. It's all doctors, right? It's mostly yeah. doctors, you know, just from a very logical uh, medical standpoint. And it's, you know, we overcomplicate it because there has to be sides like politics, like everything. There has to be sides. Like it's really simple. Like your parents are right and you're a kid, eat your veggies. Like it's not that complicated. <laughs> overcomplicate everything in this life it's insane but forks over knives is a great one because forks over knives was like the original documentary that sort of triggered a slew of plant-based documentaries and opening people's eyes to the correlation between diet and and our health so that's an amazing one and then since then there's been like you know cowspiracy what the health Uh game changers they're all friends of mine and they're all incredible i like what the health too that was a good one yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I totally agree. I, when I watched Forks Over Knives, my daughters are 27 and 28. I went to them and said, This is, you know, five years, six years ago. I was like, I'm sorry. I didn't know any better, you know, because I, when you grow up, especially in the States, you know, the, the pyramid and the whole thing, yeah. the dairy and more milk and this and that, that's what you're told as a parent to do for your kids. Absolutely. It's not anybody's fault. It's literally marketing. We are yeah. so this con and it's bizarre when you start to look into it because you may have read more into it now but when you look back on the food system like that and you look who sponsored the pyramid yeah, food, yeah. like well it's ironic it was sponsored by the dairy industry or you imagine know, that it's always a, it, there's a bias there right yeah and you know it's quite often studies are funded by the very industry that wants them to you know to shine a light on on their product looking good so and again it all just comes back to consumers that's what drives me crazy like a power is all with us because if you if all the consumers send a market signal by stopping buying something but well, we we don't know what happen information yet it, they will shift it's, they're not doing it for nefarious purposes they're you know they're doing it because there's a market so if the market signals all the money which, which it is which is beautiful so like my whole life it felt like nothing would ever happen 
And then in the last just even five to seven years, the change has just been profound because of all these documentaries yeah. and people wanting to take their health into their own hands. And I think one of the upsides of the pandemic was that time off and people at kind time. of yeah. what really matters, cooking at home a bit more, watching these documentaries when they may not have stopped to, to look at them and going, oh, OK, because, you know, there's a pill for every ill. But, you know, that food Imagine if you didn't medicine, have to take a pill. Exactly, exactly. But yeah, I mean, I could ramble on that for days. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's why I was excited to talk to you, because being a bass player is one thing. It's awesome. You know, I had I had Rudy Sarso on the show. No, Rudy. And Rudy's awesome. I, for some reason, I get a lot of good bass players. I had Jeff Jones. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, I'd like, it's all the rhythm section, I guess. Very good friendies. <laughs> I, I agree. But I had Steve Stevens on. He's a pretty good guitarist, too. Yeah, there's some guitarists are more modest. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. are, are used to being in the background. So, we're, you know, our, our egos aren't up front anyway. I'm always joking about that with my band members. <laughs> it's the rhythm section, right? Exactly. We're there to hold it down. <laughs> exactly. And get it started. Mm -hmm. So, the, I, I saw in an interview, um, you're a big fan of Sea Shepherd. Yes. If you actually, you'll see the flag over my head. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I can see it. Uh, I actually, yeah. <laughs> I, I I came back on a flight with Dave Hans, the, the, and uh, he had he had a Sea Shepherd shirt on. I said, "Hey, that's a cool shirt. Where'd you get it?" And he goes, "Well, I'm kind of the president of the uh, nice. you know, CEO of Sea Shepherd." I'm like, "Holy shit! I'm, I'm a huge fan of your show and all that." So, I, I, I'm I'm waiting to get him on the show. He's got a yeah, they're really good people. Um, Pete Peter ha Peter Hammerst. I always pronounce his name wrong because of my accent. Hammerstead. He'll kill me for that, but uh, he yeah. just did a TED Talk, and uh, that's really powerful. I send it to you. But yeah, Sea Shepherd are one of those, because I've been an activist my whole life, an animal rights activist since I was a little girl working in shelters. Like, I was the front line, like, picketing, all the, you name it, writing letters to the government. Like, I was such a pain in the ass. <laughs> Got most of that out of my system young, and then realized that actually conversation and opening dialogue and yeah. talking to every side is better but when you're a young passionate activist you're just like you know in the emotion of that but I've always loved groups that are like direct action that's why Sea Shepherd really spoke to me because they are it's all well and good going out and picketing and doing that it's needed but you also sometimes just have to jump in and literally go in front of an illegal whaling ship and be like no <laughs> and that's how change happens you know it's so they're a very direct action group yeah. which seems to me um because I I just you know I don't I don't want there's so much there's so much sort of almost like performative activism these days with social media I don't even really like saying I'm an activist anymore because it's so watered down there's so much greenwashing and even though people mean well you know if you're still spending and putting your money into the systems that are corrupting the environment you're you know and you're saying you're this you're saying you're that that's why all these types of groups I really latch on to because they're out there and everyone on those ships is a volunteer which is wild. yeah they, and you can only do a minimum of, I, I believe it's three months. I think it has to be 90 days. So the people are there for the, that's when you know they're there for the real reason. Yeah. So, you know, well, there. yeah, you're on a ship in Antarctica <laughs> chasing whaling ships. Uh -huh. Yeah. You want to be really passionate about it, the ocean. You're, you're, you're walking the walk. As yeah, say. Exactly. But they, they have made such change happen, which is yeah. great. Well, that's, that, that's why I brought them up because, but it, I mean, how long have they been doing this? You know, with, with Paul was 20, with Greenpeace. 50 yeah, years you know exactly. and then he left Greenpeace and started yeah. it it's been like yeah it's been a long time <laughs> yeah so I mean uh what was the um the orca whale movie oh blackfish blackfish and when we when my wife and I first watched that she's like oh this isn't going to change anything people are still going to want to go see the orcas and all that but it changed it just it, yeah yeah. It changes enough and um it, need, it still needs to happen like because yeah. we'll come across that stuff because again you don't think when you're being sold this nice ad for somewhere like a sea world or that and it's like oh they look really happy and you know maybe you're not that connected to the whole animal you know empath yeah. thing that's in everybody or, or you don't know you yeah know. or you don't know and you're seeing this nice ad and the trainers are smiling and the whales seem to be happy and it's da 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 but then when you actually find out how like how the fuck did yeah. those whales get in basically a bath which is their you know equivalent of a bath and start to understand how intelligent these beings are like yeah. why we would do them for the sake of performance it's just so disgusting so again it comes back to that thing of like if you spend money supporting these places they will stay open and they just shouldn't um right. you know like there's other ways to like they can become conservation they can become education um there's some amazing stuff happening with like uh 
the robots. So I don't know if you've seen any of these, like they're, they're starting to make like dolphins and whales that look completely real, but they're oh, like, wow. yeah. So you, you get the experience. Kids can get the experience of going to like an aquarium. Yeah. None of the animals are animals, but they see, you know, and it's, it's very new, but I think it's incredible. And that could be a huge step yeah. forward. Huge. But it's funny you mentioned that because this morning I had a timeline, you know, the memory pop-ups you got on your phone. And I got this timeline memory from like three or four years ago. And I was in San Diego for, I think, a studio session and the hotel I was staying in. I opened the first booklet and it was like, what to see? Like attractions. Yeah, yeah. Sea World. Sea World. I, wrote, I wrote this big, long note like, <laughs> don't spend know. your money here. <laughs> so yeah. so next know. time I stay in San Diego, I'll look for that book. <laughs> for that book and be like tanya was here <laughs> exactly i know who wrote this yeah yeah but it's important to use your voice like you know animals yeah. you, you know you have to speak up for the voices per se because yeah. it's part of the ecosystem and stuff like, especially that kind of stuff it's like come on it's 2022 like we're, we're over aquarium parks like let's stop <laughs> well and everything's you know like you said it's it's you know it could take decades yeah but I, I always said, like, like, even with eating, right? Better is better. So if, if I, I had a friend who was like, how did, how did you stop eating meat? And he's like, I'm like, well, you just, stop. you just stop. But I said, I go, if, cause he, he was, he goes, I eat meat every meal. And I right. go, I, I, you know, I know. And he goes, I said, but if you cut out one meal a day, you know, better is better. That's 33% better. That's seven meals of eating something healthier. Absolutely. I agree so. so much. And I sometimes get like sort of given out to by the vegan community about this because I'm very much about that. If you can like in an ideal world, yes, everybody goes plant based and we have this like conscious awakening that it's just better for the planet or whatever. But in the meantime, if you start to progress towards more and more plant based because you have to meet people where they're at because you everyone comes from a different culture and family yeah. is different. Like cooking is so tied into our culture and our family yeah. and our psychology. That like you said, if you take out, if there's a day a week or you do a meat-free day or two meat-free days and you just start to go that, and then you start to really understand and explore what you can do with plant-based cooking, which is wild. Like I have so many heavy meat eater friends that yeah. are, I'll make them bolognese and there's no meat in it. And it's mostly vegetables. It's not fake meat. And they're just like, Jesus, I never would have known. I'm like meat, you know, it's about texture. It's about flavor. Yeah. And then you feel better. Like everybody feels better. And that's one thing on the road with like all the bands I tour with. I'm always like pulling at them to come for more and more plant-based. And I try to make the backstage writers as plant-based as possible. And then people are like, oh, I feel better. I'm like, yep. Oops. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting because the guy that asked me about that, his dad had a heart issue. You know, mm -hmm. he's in his late seventies. And I said, well, what, what did the doc say? And he goes, he gave them the, a plant-based meal guide. Wow. And I'm like, why, why, why wait till you're 70 having heart issues? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great to hear more and more doctors are doing that. Yeah. You be like, here's a pill. I hear that so much more often now, which is great where doctors are saying, maybe you should, you know, cut down on your consumption of animal products, because obviously we have a plethora of information and studies that it's directly correlated with heart disease. And it's, it's, it, then it's down to the person, right? Because change is hard for people. Absolutely. As soon After as you 40 or 50 years of, especially at that, at that age, so you've kind yeah. of gone like literally half your life eating a certain way, yeah. but you know, you just want to embrace it. And that's why I think those documentaries and everything are so inspirational because you can see, especially things like forks over knives, because it's not like a bunch of 18 year olds being like, Oh, I'm vegan. And it's great. It's like yeah. doctors yeah. from different age demographics talking about the facts and it's wonderful. And it really speaks to like every demographic. So it's, it's, it's great to hear that, that like more and more doctors are saying, Hey, maybe try the plant-based thing. <laughs> yeah. You, it's, yeah. I mean, since you're not healthy, it's, it's interesting too. Yeah. No harm in trying right before we have to cut you apart and put a, <laughs> give it a shot. I have a good friend in New York who's a, a vegan cardiologist and his whole goal is to put cardiologists out of business. And it's amazing yeah. because he's like, look, here are the studies I've, you know, I've seen some of his lectures and it's incredible. It's incredible what you can do with food. People who are on the verge of massive heart attacks give six to eight weeks. Six, and yeah. Now they have the arteries of a child and you're like, wow. <laughs> Well, it's sad. My, my dad passed. Uh, he had Alzheimer's and and dementia. And, and the doctor said, you know, he ate, he ate terrible for decades. And the doctor said he could get better 
because they were talking about opening up his stents, you know, and his, and his arteries and all that. He, they said if he just starts eating better, he won't need that stuff. Right. And he wouldn't do it. It's it's really yeah. hard to crack the code at that age. But like, and now, yeah. now loads of studies starting to come out. Two of my friends are working on one of like what you can do throughout your life to try to prevent things like yeah. um, dementia because you know it's it's relatively new to being studied but obviously like the cognition side of it keeping yourself learning and stimulated but diet is so important and it's it's almost sad for generations past that didn't have the information but at least yeah. going forward so you can you can give it your best like why wouldn't you want to feel like I don't want to just add years to my life you want to like add life to your years right <laughs> I don't want to, you know, I want to live way over a hundred. I want to be sedentary, but I want to be upside down doing yoga handstands with long gray dreadlocks feeling, (laughs) you know, out of my head in a nursing home. So why not? Like, it's like the building blocks to your lifestyle. Like, you know, well, I'm plant-based, vegan, vegetarian, whatever the fuck you want to call it. My whole life, basically, I was four when I realized what meat was and people still are like, but where do you get your protein from? I'm Uh. like, I'm alive. Like you're talking yeah. to me. It's been over 30 years. I think I'm a good like flag for you can be done. <laughs> and well, I was going to ask you, you've toured with, you know, like you said, Dee Snyder and Steven Adler. And uh, I, I, that's a pretty cool platform for you to be able to do these other things. I kind of like this podcast is the same way, right? Yeah. Like I, I get to reach people that may not Versus me just being a sales rep and going out. And yeah. Well, I think me. that's like our purpose in this life, as far as I'm concerned, is to, you know, serve others in some yeah. way. I have this love hate relationship with social media because I have a platform from all the bands I've been in, but I don't want to be on there just for the sake of like posting. Yes. Stuff. So for me, having a platform is the perfect reason to do what I do obviously I love music and I love performing but it's way bigger than me why I do it because it gives me a a platform to talk about what I'm really really passionate about which was in me long long before I picked up a bass so it kind of was like a a a natural weird progression of ending up with this career and then going okay well what can I do with this platform and do all these other projects and sort of use my voice for you know a good cause um yeah, because I really don't like I couldn't imagine just being on social media or having a platform for a purpose that's just you. Like it just seems so exhausting mentally. <laughs> so, you know, and you know, each to their own. But uh, for me, it's definitely like having a platform is everything and but using it wisely, not just like shouting about an issue. I've learned that from being such a long term yeah. activist or whatever you want to label it. I really like to talk to people from diametrically opposed opinions, because I think if you can find two level headed people from very, very different viewpoints, it's exactly where the biggest growth is. And that's why I love talking to people like I, you know, literally talking to people, obviously like farmers and people who are butchers and yeah. whatever, like just totally different viewpoints on this. But it's because it's this whole thing of like, we don't see things differently. We sort of see the same thing differently. It's uh, or say yeah, it's 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 just weird. It's like that's where I, I think we go wrong with platforms and social media. We sort of we end up going into these echo chambers where okay, I'm I'm a vegan and I want to hang out with vegans and I think like vegans, or yeah. I'm a, I'm left or right politically and I want to hang out with that, or I only want to talk to bass players or whatever it is, and that's ridiculous because unless yeah. we completely open up the spectrum of conversation, we're never going to get anywhere. So I think that's re- a really really important part of growth because it's important like it's like when it comes to things like animal agriculture it's a massive issue it's Jeez. massive for the environment obviously the obvious points but the, these are people's livelihoods they're tied into it as well so you have to look at how do you switch the system instead of just like shouting and pointing the finger how do you switch the system where the farmers win where the land wins where the consumer wins where your health wins like it's you know it's not just a simple like oh overnight no so, yeah, a lot of it comes down to like using our platforms wisely like that. So yeah, you'll find me in some weird chat houses, like, you know, with the soil experts. And I'm just a dork. Like I'm just totally dork. I'm a dork. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit of a dork like that. But, you know, so, that's, that's the point in having a platform, right? That's it. Well, so for my audio listeners, how long are your dreads? Two, three feet? <laughs> well, they're tied up now. Yeah, so yeah. Now they're just like, yeah, lower back almost sitting on them I just took I just so I brush them out all the time and like 
That's why they're all both. That's why I give myself a haircut. But yeah, I've had my dreads for 12 years. So just for my auto listeners, you mentioned the great dreads, so I didn't. Yeah, big, long, long dreads. And I represent the dreads are not what people preconceive as dreads most of the time. And they're fabulous and clean and they can be, you know, just as fabulous as anyone else's hair. So I represent, <laughs> I, I fly the dread flag because there's an awful misconception around the world about dreads. It's very frustrating. <laughs> Well, the, 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 I, I had Maxi Priest on. I've had uh, Steve Kuhr from Third World, you know, and uh, it's interesting that you're right. There is the misconception of it. Yeah, it's the same as normal hair. Wash it, dye it, brush yeah, it. Just, take it look after them. It's not like I just let my hair turn into mats. That's a very different thing, just for the, yeah. all of the listeners. <laughs> well, so are you a natural blonde or are you a natural brunette? Or both? Um, yeah, this is my natural color. Yeah. <laughs> funny though, I was I was blonde as a baby. Oh, me too. Yeah. And I, then I, I went there and then Absolutely. Yeah, I mean if you look back over my career, I've had every because you can, you know, I dye my dreads different colors over the years. They've been purple, they've been pink, they've been everything. So they're just half and half now. I was like, let me do half and half. <laughs> I'm getting the half and half with the grays. That's all. Yeah. It's totally different. Yeah, when I start when I, whenever my dreads start to go gray, hopefully they'll all just like uniformly go gray and it'll be re really rad. <laughs> It won't happen that way. Probably not. <laughs> not, not uniform, at least. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. You know, with all your travels, what uh, what's the most influential place you've been to so far? What's influenced you the most? Um, a couple of different places stick out. South Africa was, will forever be one of my favorite places I've been because there is just something about being there. I mean, it's the motherland, right? Yeah about like when you're there it feels different and the nature there is so profound like it's I mean the the word awe doesn't work it's just like I can't even describe how beautiful it is um you know the, the, just it's it's a different level it's a different level and the energy down there is beautiful the people are beautiful such as such an intense history um, that there's still a very intense feeling, you know, the, with the apartheid and then the politics and all that. But then the love of the land and yeah. the food and the culture and the people. There's something about South Africa that always just stuck with me. And I was lucky enough to go into the townships in Langa and spend some time with people in the townships and that with the kids in, in one of the biggest townships in, in South Africa, Langa. And that was a really, you know, amazing moment because it it puts a lot of things into perspective. It's like literally the poorest people in the world who have absolutely nothing, but they're some of the happiest I people. I was going to say, yeah. I'll never forget those children because immediately after I was there, I was there and, you know, there's like six or seven kids in a family and they all sort of look after each other depending on the age demographic and they're playing with whatever they can make football out of and they're really smart and they're really engaging and they don't know any better, right? Yeah. And then I got on a flight and flew back to true New York and I got out and the first thing I see is a kid like giving out that he doesn't have the newest fucking iPad or some shit to his yeah. parents. And I just thought, wow, and it's not that kid's fault, right? He's just raising the different It's cultural. Yeah. It's cultural, but it really was like, wow, that'll always stick with me because the kids there and, you know, and, and just South Africa is so, Africa is so beautiful. Um, and yeah, there's like, I mean, just on this last tour, I fell in love with Tallinn, Estonia. I just mind oh, wow. where I hadn't been yet. And it's a medieval city. Um, you know that relatively recently joined the EU so it's got this really cool like so modern old. happening but it's like spectacular medieval city um, so it's it's just got this beautiful um, feel to it and really really like forward thinking plant-based everything friendliest people everybody everybody of every age range speaks multiple languages which is so yeah. impressive um, so yeah there's a few places like that that, that will always take and obviously Ireland is home my heart's in Ireland <laughs> What, what what place have you have you not visited that you want to? Um, I have not yet been to Australia because oh, I had wow. two or three tours. Funny enough, two or three tours that were heading there either cancelled or rescheduled. Yeah. In COVID. Um, where else? I really want to go to Bhutan. That's just for me, for my myself. Bhutan is high, high on my bucket list. We have to like apply for a, a visitor visa for Bhutan. It's very special. really it's considered like one. It's literally. We call it like the happiest place in the world. So the base of the Himalayas. So I really, really want to go there. Um, but yeah, there's there's still a few people. Like I'd like to go to Antarctica. <laughs> yeah. Just say I went. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's a couple of places I still need to hit up for sure. I did. I toured China, but I've never been to Japan yet. 
so I'd like to get over to Japan. Um, but yeah, I've been I've been lucky with my travels. I've been a lot of places, a band wow. to a lot of places. Uh, let me ask you this question: How much is it luck, and how much is it is is hard work? Meaning, you, you did something that the other thing I want to talk to you about was uh, you did something that most people would never do in their life. <laughs> leave your home country and come to a different country not knowing anybody i mean virtually nobody with no guarantee of job yeah I mean, that, that's so, that's so ballsy that's crazy yeah. yeah and you know it's it was when i look back i'm like i would probably never do it now it's like <laughs> <laughs> oh, i probably would but i i've always sort of worked well under that type of pressure if that makes sense so i don't like other than touring with bands for instance, like I like traveling on my own a lot or my days off, I'll like plan on my own because if you're waiting on people, it changes like your own opportunity yeah. a lot of the time. So when it came down to this, I had done so many gigs in Ireland and I was really, really passionate about trying to become a session musician at that point. I just like figured out what that was. And I did a session before I came to LA, I had done the session with Maynard Keenan in Arizona. And as soon as I did that and someone like Maynard had brought me into, I went, wow, like, that level of artist could hire me if I'm in America. Yeah. Because it just won't happen in Ireland, Ireland. Or, Berlin or, you know, it's a different scene and they're great scenes. But the reality was, if you want to like try and go big, it's like go big or go home. So I was like, well, fuck it. Let's go <laughs> to LA. Because if, especially, and if you're on your own, you're going to have to network. I'm going to say network, it's just really talking for an Irish person, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I figured like just dive in because I, I really believe like across anything you want to do in life. And I'm always saying this to people. If, if there's something that you're trying to do, you have to find the people who are already doing it yeah. and then surround yourself by them. So I'm like, well, if I want to I want to go out and, you know, you start asking around about jam nights. And where are the people that play with the big bands? They're all playing jam nights when they're off the road. OK, start going to the jam nights, start going to the NAM show, start going to, you know, at the time, there was more like little base expos and stuff. They're kind of gone now, but just go and be surrounded. And you're, I'm literally there like, hey, I'm here looking for a gig. And then eventually it's like, oh, that Irish girl has yeah. like, had enough of a CV behind me that I could, you know, prove my worth per se. Um, and it's just that it was like just tediously chipping away at getting into a scene. And then eventually someone's like, all right, let her up on stage. And then you play and then it's like, oh, OK, she can play. And then yeah. it's like, I want to do a studio session. And then it's just this bizarre just whirlwind that happened from that. And it's like, bam, 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 gig, gig, gig. Once it started, it never stopped. So, um, Yo. yeah. yeah, until COVID, it was like just five, six straight years of touring with different bands, like back to back. So, and it was great. And that doesn't always happen like that. And it wasn't easy because you're also like, I was just talking to a um, band made of mine this morning about this, a very exhausting thing about what you do as a hired gun is you're sometimes you're just filling in for a bass player, for instance, yeah. and someone's sick or someone's double booked and you're like, okay, can you do these two shows or these three shows? And you have to learn an insane amount of music or you learn a load of music and then something's rescheduled or you learn a bunch of music and it's just a short tour and you're constantly in this cycle of like, Learn, yeah. yeah which is you know it's tiring because that's the part that people don't understand the work you do pre going on tour rehearsals you're not paid for that your time it's it's up to you to just like put it in so big gigs take a lot of work yeah um, and it, it's just the nature of what we do but uh it, it was interesting when covid first hit because it was it was kind of good for me to stop for a minute because i just like deer in head. Yeah. I'm like oh my god i haven't been off the road because i went from I was with an artist called Jordan Fisher for a while. He's like a pop R&B guy. And then I went immediately from him to Dee Snider. In between that, I had like two or three major sessions. And then I went to Stephen Adler and Dee Snider, and I was back and forth and then Whitesnake. And I was like, bam, like the whole thing was just like. <laughs> so it was, and before that, I was like in the river dance back home. So it was, uh, yeah, I, ne I needed a break with COVID. <laughs> that, it's funny that a lot of musicians have told me that. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's what Maxi Priest, who who got stuck in Jamaica. Oh wow. Because uh, he was he's from England. Yeah. Um, he said, you know, he he was he had he had taken some hiatuses before. Yeah. And then but when you're forced to be in a hiatus, yeah. he wasn't so happy. You know, yeah. it, it, he, he allowed him to work on different things and different projects. 
mm-hmm. all of a sudden you kind of get that, hey, let me get back on the road. So yeah. And lucky for me, like I have this other passion. So what did the time yeah. off touring music did, although I toured in the middle of it for most of like the second year of COVID, I was still going out with, with Adler and a few other flight aid things because a lot of the US was still functioning as normal. Yeah. We were able to gig a little bit over here, but I had Highway to Health, the TV show that I do with Derek Green. Um, we started editing that because we hadn't had a minute to stop. So we, you know, all these other projects, and like, you know, I speak in the activism world a lot, just on panels and stuff online. I was like, okay, let me put some focus into being at home and being able to do this and, and building around that yeah. and take a break. And then, you know, and then it slowly started to come back. And then it was like, all right, let's go. Wait, snake, bam. Yeah. <laughs> And so I'll be back. I enjoyed the the time. It wasn't really time off. I worked most of it, but not yeah, yeah. having to be on the movie. touring. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's what's interesting because I was the same way. It's like all of a sudden, like I'm not traveling. My wife's like, "It's kind of weird having you home." I know. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, we'll leave it's kind of weird for me being home. But I, you know, let's paint the house. Let's um, let's start growing some plants. Let's start, you know. I became a plant mom. Who didn't? Yeah, didn't yeah. Know? <laughs> and you start petting them and you start talking to your plants and oh, yeah and then you leave for tour and they die and it's sad <laughs> no comment <laughs> thankfully my wife can stay she stays home she sends me pictures of them because we name them all so i've done that too I'm yeah sure. <laughs> yeah so but we read that that helps so we're like hey whatever whatever yeah. it takes they respond to outside stimulus yeah, exactly sure. <laughs> so yep yeah. uh white snake so the, the the cancel got toured canceled or delayed yeah so david and we had an amazing european tour it yeah. went pretty much perfectly uh and we're lucky because uh, so many bands are not staying out more than a few weeks at the yeah. moment it's bizarre like either insurance or someone gets sick with whatever it is yeah. and it seems like bands are just like dropping off like two weeks into a tour and we did it we like made it till the very end there's a few shows canceled but he was starting to get sick at the end of it and he has this is he can get covid and he just got this like lingering infection like sinus and an upper respiratory and as a singer it's something that if you push through and he was pushing through and it was like okay now he needs to and he he was feeling like he was going to be able to do north america up until right before it yeah. but then he had a total relapse and it's just one of those things it's like if you push through this you will probably forever lose your your voice and you Not could like worth it. It was too deep of an infection. Like he's been going through it, you know, David, he really went through it the last um, six or seven weeks and they've been trying everything to get him back. But it's, you know, you have to make a decision. We're we're all super sad about it, obviously, um, because we were ready to go. We were ready to do North America. But um, at the end of the day, it's his health and it's it's, it's more important than any of our gig per se. So it's, you know, he has to make that decision and he's got it and we're all got it and we're all, we're the best of buds. Like it's such a fan family. So right now he just, he needs to get better and then, you know, decide what's best for him. So we have to, as hired guns, we have to be grateful for an amazing tour. Yeah. It was an amazing tour we just came off and it was very, very successful. And we got some great footage of that. It's going to be turned into like a farewell DVD, which is exciting. And he still wants to record and he still wants to do a bunch of things. So, and, you know, we, we all talk almost every day. We're super tight. So, um, so we'll see, but right now he just needs to get better, you know? Yeah. So I was going to ask you as a hired gun where you sit there and you go, okay, I thought I was going to be busy for the next three or four months. Now I'm not. Well, I'm really good at having many things lined up. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I learned the hard way a long time ago, never to put all your vegan eggs in one basket. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I do do so many other things. Like I, I, I do a lot of work in the plant-based world that, you yeah. know, I can jump back into that space. I've already got a couple of calls about gigs that I'm sort of contemplating which one is best for me. And that I'm again at that space where I'm like, should I spend the next few months focusing on the plant-based stuff and working in that space and building that up? Or should I go right back to another gig? And, you know, I basically just need like a week to think about which is best. Cause sometimes it's nice to have, like, for me, I like, because I have all these other passions. I like to have chunks of time that aren't touring and aren't music. Yeah. Because you know, I haven't really, you know, t- when you're building up your career, like I was the past few years when I first moved here, you have to be out in the scene all the time. And then it's like, all right, people know who you are. You've been in a bunch of bands. They know, they know where to find you if they want you. Yeah. It's not, oh my God, I got to be out every day. So, um, so we'll see. But right now I'm putting a lot of focus in, into a plant-based project with some friends and, and trying to get Highway to Health finished up and get that edited because we have a lot of footage that we shot 
which is great. Um, and we want to kind of get that tightened up and then we'll see. We'll see in, you know, in the next month or so what, what unfolds. I was curious. You, how, I think people would be shocked about how much footage and then how much editing goes into it. Oh, we have terabytes of footage. Like, <laughs> for anyone that doesn't know what it is, like we, I shot this show called Highway to Health with the singer from Sepultura. I don't know if you saw the trailer, but yeah. we went out very unusually and actually shot most of the footage ourselves instead of just like pitching a concept because me and Derek were touring. So we're like, well, let's... You're already there. We're already in these places or close by. Yeah. Let's sort of take advantage of who we are, what we do already, and also keep the budget down. And you just have your crew and, you know, some of it's covered by the tour. So we actually ended up filming like seven episodes of a, a plant-based TV show um, while we were out on the road, just literally just before, like we stopped filming March of 19. 10, I think, 2020. We just stopped right as, and I got back to New York and then COVID hit and everyone was like, next oh. week. Yeah, yeah. No, the next week. It was bizarre. So we just got all that done. So we have terabytes and terabytes of footage that we need to like see we have a lot of it edited down but working on that you know working with because it's a brutal industry it's as bad as the music industry you know? it is yeah sales agents and pitching and da, 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 da. so you know we got that to focus on we've got a bunch of different stuff to focus on so um yeah there's no shortage of things to do in my life that's for sure <laughs> well i was gonna ask you too because and I, I don't know i'm trying to think of, as, as a musician where you're i mean you have a lot of downtime as a touring musician I mean, you're on the bus, you're on a plane, you know, and then you have sound check, but then you have three or four hours. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you find that your, your activism or your plant-based activities kind of help fill that downtime? Yeah. I mean, I don't have a lot of downtime. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way. I don't either now. Yeah. yeah I, can, I the, the few hours before a show, absolutely. Cause I want to warm up. I want to do some yoga. I want to, you know, I eat very specifically on a show day because you don't want to eat too close to performing so you know your show day itself is a little different um but usually like I, I could be writing an article i could be speaking on a panel like i just i don't do well being i should get better of sitting and being still you know good luck with that learning a lot more from my friend mo goda i don't know if you know mo's work he's like the happiness expert but he's all about like trying to master that like monk life half of the time where it's yeah. like Stop thinking you have to do things all the time, but it, I don't know. It's always how it's been. But yeah, you have to, like a show day is a very different thing. It depends where you are. Like we could be flying in from a different country. You could be rock, rocking up. Yeah. But sometimes you're rocking up just before the show and you have like 45 minutes. You're like, shit, I warm my fingers up and go. Some days are, yeah, you have all day and you're in the middle of nowhere. So I'll just try to fill it with, you know, I'll do some yoga. I love to read. I like to write. I do a little bit of that. I'll eat, you know, healthy, lighter and earlier on a show day um but yeah it's uh the, the the work in touring is not the performing the work yeah. is travel i mean you know what's your job the work is the travel like living together with a group of people everyone has to get along you have to be really good at personalities and and blending and understanding personal space and understanding how to live in small quarters together if you're on a bus or you know being reliable and being the, always on time early all that stuff because then it makes the the whole thing take over so much easier do you think uh, it's so interesting you said all that? Because I, I always tell people I drive for a living and I do meetings in between, you know, especially in California and Los Angeles, there's just a lot of traffic. So, yeah, you know, I, I could drive six hour round trip for a 20 minute meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's, and that's the work. That's essentially the part you're getting paid for. Yeah. Like, we can't say, you're like, you kidding me? This is a pleasure. It's like the one thing in my life that I'm like completely present when I'm on stage. And yeah. That's why performing you're like you're in the performance with your band which is beautiful but that's you know an hour 90 minutes <laughs> like, the travel the chaos something's gone wrong something's with the gear you know sound checks chaos something went down <laughs> and it's, there's almost always something there's always something. Yeah. there's always something that's where i came up with the show name the travel wins because for me i i especially when i was younger i mean much younger everything was always about how much am i going to make on this trip you know so now I, I, I try to, I'll stop and take a picture at the side of the road or I'll, I'll go to a museum or I'll, I'll take a different route mm -hmm. just so it's something different. And then that, that way I create a win in my own head. Yeah. So I'm not stressed about the meeting. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, and that's like, if you don't take advantage of chat, like it's my favorite thing about it. 
bands I'm in always laugh at me. Some guys in the bands want to get up and about and see, and some are just like creatures of habits that don't yeah. leave the hotel at all. I'm like, oh, no matter how tired I am, I want to see like the medieval city. I want to find like yeah. nice places to eat. I want to take pictures. I want to do this because that's like, I mean, that's travel memory bank, literally, instead of just going through the motions, like you said, it's yeah. they're the things you remember at the end of your life, you know, not the the meeting. <laughs> yeah. It was an epic meeting. Um, you know, it's the memories from travel and, and interacting with local people and understanding different cultures and experiencing the local food. And, you know, it's that's my favorite part about touring, other than obviously the performances are amazing, but just going out and exploring. And no matter where you are, even if it's, you know, somewhere within the US or somewhere really, really exotic or far away you've never been, it's, you know, people are just people everywhere. That's what's so fun about the world. Yeah. That's what pisses me off about mass media and these weird you know they feed people all these weird biases and i don't like it and people who've never traveled are the very ones that will give out about a certain culture and you're like have you ever been there have you ever met yeah. from that culture no so shut up <laughs> yeah, well, all over the world are just going about their day like me and yeah. you for the most part and there's crazy people everywhere so <laughs> well and it's always the, the, that's the clickbait part right i mean when, when there's a, a forest fire you know 200 miles away from me my aunt and uncle back east are calling me saying hey are you okay and i'm like yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good why news oh it's on fire stuff. california's on fire yeah yeah the I'm news like, that everyone's gonna die in california yeah I'm so like, california's a big place there's fires everywhere i go there's gonna be tens of millions of people that die before it gets to me we're fine we'll be yeah. all right yeah it's a yeah don't even get me started on the media that's another rant the <laughs> <laughs> advent of mass media <laughs> but yeah but that's yeah now, do you think the COVID helped people kind of see, you know, beyond the mass media behind the, you know, like we were talking about forks and over knives and it gave people time to, to see, I, for me, it did. So that's why I asked. Yes. And no, it depends. Like I, cause it's such an interesting thing. I watch so many friends like shape their opinions in different ways. Um, yeah. uh, I always, I don't watch any news um i get my news from reliable sources and like real journalism um but watching my friends that like say picked a specific side say they watch cnn or, or whatever Fox, yeah whatever they choose to watch they are just regurgitating rhetoric that's exact you know and not necessarily fact checking the information that they're letting into their head the whole time so it's it's interesting and it's like sometimes it's better just not to have an opinion on these things because the thing is we don't know on the grand scale of things about a lot of factors of COVID. We just don't because it's still semi not yeah. Well, I don't mean just about COVID, but I mean about uh, curiosity, things in general, right? Whether yeah. it's f food or living, meditation, yoga. I mean, yeah. I got into sound baths and a whole bunch of stuff because yeah, yeah. I just started See, looking into it. What's sad in a way is like, the, the and I know what the start was, like everyone's just in panic mode. The amount of money that was, you know, spent wrongly across it, which is a whole other conversation. Yeah. You didn't see any national health campaigns, which was frustrating. So it was kind of down to the individual to go, well, we don't really know what's happening. We don't know. You know, so many different strains. All these things are going on. How about I stay healthier in the meantime? And I give my body all the means possible to have yeah. a healthy immune system. Um, but so much of that is also mental as well. Like that thing of like, turn off the fucking news. Like that's yeah. causing like the cortisol peak in you the stress all this so yeah it's it's a funny one like i think for a lot of people yeah they turned a little bit more inward and got more into health and that but then a lot of people got like super lazy about it and you know fast food chains were busier than ever when i was still living in hollywood when it hit in south hollywood and i was like oh my god i've never seen lines so long for this these drive through places so it's interesting like people took totally different rights i think coming out of it, people are realizing now the importance of like downtime things like yoga yeah. you know, stress thing how to manage your stress food all that um because you, like everything you kind of have to go through a thing to understand it yeah. Right? um but yeah i think like a lot of a lot of people did wake up a lot of people that i knew throughout my life that were never never would have given a single shit about health were like yeah. oh, it's time to because i want to be ready if i get this thing you know they had the yeah um, yeah yeah, so it's great. I think well, all... and the government telling you not to exercise, and you know, it's like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Oh my gosh, that's literally what you're supposed. Oh my god. Anyways, but, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, that that's a whole, that's a whole, that's a whole extra hour. You know, 
So what do you have coming up? Other, I mean, so you got the the, the Highway to Hell show that you're going to be pitching. Health. Health, excuse me. Yeah, I was thinking of ACDC. My bad. Well, obviously, we, we took our inspiration a little. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got a studio. I have a gig that I may take, but I'm not going to announce yet. But, I, you know, if, that, if I say yes in the next week or so, I'll be head down learning that because it's quite difficult. Um, I have a couple of studio sessions in LA. I have some travel for like plant-based conferences that I'll be a part of because I have a project that I'm starting that's kind of like a plant-based advisory board and like for businesses um, to nice. make carbon carbon footprint lower because there's so much greenwashing. Um, so I have just all these different projects that are connected to the plant-based world, some, some recording and then some of the music for Hybrid Tell, which I'll do myself um and yeah there's there's that many projects i'm actually like hmm. <laughs> what else yeah. I talk you, about. you have like a whiteboard and you just keep up yeah this time of year as well there's a lot of i do i literally have a whiteboard here where like <laughs> yeah because each day this week is like a lot of podcasts this week for instance like this yeah. is, i'm home after not being home for a while so all the podcast requests i just like put into a week sure all the different time zones i have on a whiteboard here because i just do these global ones but yeah and then this time of year in in the animal rights world there's a couple of like galas on and um yeah. conferences and things like that so i'll be at all of those and yeah and then also just trying after being gone for four or five months straight just trying to take a few days here and there and like just recenter and go i live in the desert i'm out near joshua tree so i'm oh like, nice maybe take a couple of days and just go and be in nature and just like not be in such a a rush to always do 400 things at once <laughs> do, you, do you find it that uh being around the peacefulness out there because i like i actually have land in jock and um yucca valley well no i'm in yucca valley yeah so <laughs> yeah it, it's you know it's i love it here for the peacefulness the summer is very hot as you know yeah. like right now it's cooled down just the last few days but it was like 105 degrees it's a lot lot yeah. you, i'm able for desert life. especially for your irish right yeah but it's funny i'm like a natural desert head uh, a lot of people come here thinking like oh i'll leave la and do the thing and they cannot desert yeah. live funny because you know you get lizards you get spiders yeah, you gotta get used to like you're living in desert um but it's very my favorite thing about here is the desert sky at night like yeah. it's phenomenal it's just there's no light pollution so it's incredible and it's yeah, there's so no ambient light so yeah, it's incredible, especially if you're up in the high eye desert, you go up to the likes of Pioneer Town and it's just spectacular. Like, yes, peace. But, you know, I and then but you have to I have to be in L.A. a lot for work. So I have to balance that with accepting the fact that I have to drive back and forth to L.A. all the time, which, yeah. you know, at the wrong time, as you know, can be a nightmare. But, you know, whatever. A good podcast, a good audio book and a few hours driving and, you know, try to look at everything in the positive and not be moaning about it. <laughs> well, and I found for, for at least for me, like I can for the most part, schedule my drive. So like I, like if I'm up in San Luis Obispo or whatever, and I'm like, uh, I, I don't want to leave too late because then I'll just, it's a six hour drive and it should yep. be a three hour drive. Wow. But yeah. so I, I always try and schedule my meetings and all that. And then if I have to, I just drive down the coast, yeah. you know, so I'll just come down the one and just, yeah, just take a longer drive, but at least I'm looking at the ocean instead of the freeway. Yeah. Yeah. You got, if you can do that with your job, it's great. Like just, that's what I try to do. Like either leave super, super early or yeah. Collapse super super late so although it's weird now because it doesn't seem like there is a pocket that's not rush hour <laughs> and, and it's going both ways now yeah well, a lot of people moved out here so it became this thing of like they come to their weekend houses so thursdays and yeah. sundays are what they used to be you know i have a lot of friends that moved out to palm desert and palm springs yeah yeah people are going because like everything's gone here like everything was bought up or is ridiculously expensive so people are starting to go further like 29 palms and all out yeah. there it's uh you're getting further away though <laughs> that stage. well now you're you also because I, I just uh I'm, I'm waiting to, to get them on the show with one of the um chiefs of the reservation out there they just built a new casino out there on the like 29 palm side and oh. it's out I'll, I'll have to send it to you i'm trying to remember it's i looked at it i'm like oh my god it's on the way to joshua tree like and it's there's nothing around it, and there's just a little casino there now wow like, never heard of that i've been gone for so long i didn't really hear local stuff i have to get my neighbors have to catch me up on that stuff <laughs> why bother it's small i mean it's it's not even going to be like the ones where they have you know some of the bands that play yeah yeah. You know, but small. it's us <laughs> yeah yeah I'd, look, I'd like to listen to that podcast it'd be interesting to hear his take on whether it's a, a good or a bad thing or he's you know, he's they're, they're they're having issues right now between uh 
different uh yeah so that's all government stuff because they're fighting over land and they're fighting over the, the usage of, of the name coachella wow because it's 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 the coachella valley right i mean it's it's not it's like but so he he, he tried using it the Coachella Festival, people weren't happy that he was using the name, the word Coachella. It is the Coachella Valley. And that's, so that's, but there's the lawsuits, right? Let's get, let's get everyone involved. Oh, humans. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be like, that's like, you know, someone trying to trademark Ireland. It's like, I'm well. Thinking like, how would they, like if a festival was called like Irish Eyes or something and then being like, sorry. I'm like, you can't use the word Irish. Sorry. No one else can use it. Okay, but this is Ireland. Um, all right, fair enough. <laughs> Move along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that's why I haven't had him on the show. It was about four months ago. He was like, Yeah, I can't can't do it just yet. All right, he has to wait until that's like cleared and yeah. Litigation. Just, yeah. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. Well, so how do you want people to to stay in touch and see what you have coming up? What's the best way? Best way to follow me is definitely Instagram because it's really the only place I'm active myself um, and it's linked to my other accounts. So it's just my name at Tanya O'Callaghan underscore official. Um, that's me posting on there. I yeah. do have like a Facebook page in that, but I'm not really active. They're kind of automatically tied. And the more business world, I have a LinkedIn page under my name as well. Um, yeah, but that's that's kind of where I'm. Do you have, have a website for Highway to Health yet? Well, I have a website, my own website, Tanya okay. O'Callaghan where you'll see all of the past shenanigans and through that you can go to highway to health so everything is there that i do okay on, on my own website so yeah my website and my instagram is definitely the most active places to find me <laughs> i'll make sure to uh, include that on my website just make it easy for people to do you, do you have a, a any kind of date on on, on the uh seven series seven episodes no, it's an impossible question to answer at the moment because yeah. it's out of our hands. Once it's like, it's just a very long process. Um, it's like the agents go through seven different steps and still a lot of editing. So, I mean, I'd like to say soon, it can happen either way. It can happen very fast. Sure. Or, or forever. Or exactly. And Ed, the good thing is, a lot of my friends in the documentary world, like in the Forks Over Knives and what the hell, they're like, don't worry, it took us years. I'm like, okay, yeah. Feel a bit better because we had you know you have to take into account everybody across all different industries had two years where basically everything came to a standstill yeah and the same happened with us we were like let's go and everybody was out of the office for like six months and then people start to drip back in and then all these roles change so the yeah. person you were dealing with before is gone or moved departments so it's like just now and then i immediately went on tour when the world <laughs> Yeah. So, oh my god so i'm just back now and going all right where are we at with this so i would like to say i'll have an update soon but obviously i don't know it's like how long is a piece of string at this stage but uh but either way you know we have you'll see on my instagram in my bio you can go to the yeah. page as well so you can follow the page and we, we try to keep somewhat active in the meantime there and derek's on tour again so you know both of our schedules and trying to <laughs> it's hysterical like trying to get two touring musicians who have a third project together <laughs> it's really good, fun good luck <laughs> it'll happen it just it, it'll happen, happen. it's meant to happen like yeah, i stopped yeah. taking pressure off these things a lot of time we've great yeah. content great footage great people whatever shape it comes out in eventually you know it will so and it's a big big passion project it's a completely what you call like a mission aligned project it's philanthropically funded yeah the point of is to make an impact um and to open people's eyes and it's really fun it's really like we're both lifelong veggie vegans and yeah. it's not like preachy but it's funny like we've amazing guests on it we've celebs all over the place we're on board with sea shepherd in mexico in one episode we're yeah it's fantastic it's just really fun so yeah it'll um it'll come out when whenever it comes out is my answer <laughs> It'll happen when it happens. That's you what can, I was. You can follow myself, Derek, and the page. Sure. You know, it's it's a lot of our day to day lives is the same. It's a lot of food, a lot of positive, you know, po positive information about change and whatnot. So, but yeah, we're 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 easily followed on the old socials. <laughs> as much as you may or may not want it, it, yeah, it you know. I I always say, social can be really good or it can be, yeah, horrifically bad. It's so your, use, it's your you have to like i'm very i'm getting better i fall on and off the wagon with it but like setting timers realizing when you're doom scrolling for no reason yeah 
just like going on there to do like a post that has a purpose or something or something you're promoting or whatever it is and getting off and having a time for that because they do serve a purpose but if you start letting it influence your mental health and then like the comparison game that people do with their lives yeah. it's, it can be lethal for people so there you're right there's two sides it can be beautiful it's like it, everything with ai you know it's how how we use it yeah. that's life <laughs> mm -hmm. that's life exactly well Thank you so much for your time. I will continue to follow you and I can't wait to see all the new projects coming up. It's going to be exciting. Who knows? I'll have 10 more going by next week now that I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's on you. <laughs> or maybe I'll just spend a month doing yoga. Let's see. <laughs> I either just either or. <laughs> I was going to do 10 projects, but I decided to do yoga instead. Yeah, you know what? Maybe that's exactly what I need for a few weeks. So <laughs> let's see. We'll see how it works. Thanks again, Tanya. I really appreciate the time. No problem. Thanks, Millie. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Take care.